the the different views that the teams have taken, in particular sort of the Ferrari side pods versus, I guess, the, the Mercedes side pods probably being the biggest difference, is that we don't really need to worry about that too much because we just take into account the overall era of the car in a, in a very different way. So we wouldn't apply it across the side pods differently as we would across the, the body of the car and the front and rear wings. So our, our philosophy and in that area is we are not aerodynamics engineers. We wouldn't be able to, to sort of focus on those specific, you know, like minutiae of, of the differences on a, on a Formula One car in that way. So it, that's not such a, a, a sort of a challenging area for us to, to handle. It's very much, once we know the outcome of what they've built onto those cars, we can then adjust our physics through the numbers. We've not had to actually write anything different within the physics code itself for that, but we've actually had to adjust the way in which we configure the physics based on each team. As you know, we always try and ensure that our cars perform in the same way as the, the real cars do. And something that we've obviously still got, still need to take some time to understand is any unique characteristics any of the cars you know we've always in the past through the commentary usually established you know whether a car's more prone to understeer or oversteer whether it's good on the brakes whether it's good under traction and we always try and build that into our handling models for each of the teams individually so that's still something that we're learning about this year and again that's that's something that we don't need to make any fundamental changes to the physics in game but we need to tailor the settings to build those cars to feel you know as the player would expect I think it's it's uh, it's not the most straightforward one to explain because some of the gain is naturally through what we were trying to do anyway to improve the handling model. And then obviously some of the difference comes from the cars themselves as well in the fact that they do weigh more. There's a lot more unsprung mass with those new wheels and tires as well. The way that the aero is generated under body as opposed to, to over the body. But some of the significant changes that I think players instantly will feel is that front end bite, something that we've always wanted to try and work out a more balanced sort of feel to the cars was that we had we had predominantly understeery cars i think as most people would would acknowledge and that you could wind the understeer out through the setup but ultimately understeer is safer for a player and safer in the, in the real world which is why most road cars are designed that way but we wanted to bring in that front end bite that feeling of turn in that ability to you know, really point it at the apex without worrying about the car spinning out and the back end being all over the place so building in that sort of depth and that that margin for error that margin for manipulation of the car at the limit of grip has always been a real target and a real goal for us and and you'll have found probably in some of the earlier games you know 2010 had very on on edge physics 2011 was much softer and went too far the other way 12 was a better balance so we, we've always been trying to find that balance between a car which is actually on a knife edge as formula one cars are but for a player to have that margin to still manipulate the car through a corner to come on and off the throttle to adjust its trajectory and to adjust the rotation so i think that's probably the biggest change the feeling of grip is so much higher but conversely it doesn't mean that your lap time is you know 100 faster just because it feels like you've got more grip doesn't necessarily mean you have it's how that feels as it transitions between grip and, and lack of grip Um, to be honest, no, it's very much always been a difficult, it's always been a challenge for Formula One to make a car accessible. They're, they're not known as the, the pinnacle of motorsport driven by the absolute cream of the crop for, for no reason. And for us to want to recreate that in the game does mean that it makes it difficult for us to make them more accessible as well. And that's where it's been a very long term approach for us to, you know, we started out with the, the usual suite of assists that you expect in a racing game, traction control, ABS. Uh, and we've had to completely recalibrate the traction control this year again because the cars with a different weight and the power delivery have, have did, did cause our traction control from last year to not be as effective at, the, at that high end of the scale for the, the, the high traction control users. Um, but then obviously bringing in things like the steering assist last year, bringing in the, the casual sort of the surfaces off the track and the auto reset to track. They're all part of a long-term plan to continually keep building upon our armory of things that we can use to make the game easier but never compromising what we build in the in the base for the setup. Yeah, very, very much the case. And uh, as somebody asked in the questions yesterday, which was a really good question, was 
how does that work in terms of strategy and tire wear in different compounds and this was one of the reasons why we've never really tackled it in the past because it is incredibly complicated and it does compromise that part of formula one you know it does take away to somebody who plays the game as i do i i relish the the strategy elements the tire wear the which compounds are doing what but for a player who wants to race a formula one car around a track who isn't into that sort of level of, of Formula One enthusiasm yet, or they're relatively new to it, and they just want the excitement of a Formula One car around a track they recognise. That's what adaptive AI, AI will allow them to do. And as I say, the reason why we've put in, in so three now versions of how the AI will perform is the ultra slow one, they, they are, to a player who, who can drive a car on a racing game, they're a hindrance because they are going to be really, you know, allowing you to stay very close to them. Then we have the standard level of adaptive AI, which is for a player who, who can at least drive the car. They've at least got some concept of what they're doing and it keeps them in the race. It keeps it you know close and exciting. And then to you know, you, you, your average racing game player who wants more of a realistic Formula One experience, we obviously have the AI setting as we've always had traditionally with the scale between obviously you know, the, the 25% up to 110%. So it's, it's very much a case of if I was a professional racing game player and I set about playing the game with adaptive AI, I would probably damage my experience because they would do things that I wouldn't expect them to do, which is go slower through certain corners, you know, not get on the throttle so readily. Um, so it's very much an experience tailored to that end of the, of the, um, the audience. Before we move on, have you subscribed to racing games yet? Just one click and you're on the racing games grid. Oh, and hit that notification bell too, so you never miss an upload. All right, on with the video. Yeah, again, a lot of the things that we do talk about are things that have been discussed for 10, 11 years. And if you think about back when we did 2010, 11, 12, we had locations in paddock, in the paddock area and things like that. And there were regular discussions around, well, living the life of an F1 driver, you know, F1, live the, be the driver, live the life and, and taglines like that we've had previously, expand away from just the on-track experience, you know, you, and, and drive to survive has really opened people's eyes to the lifestyle of a Formula One driver, the sort of places they live, the kinds of cars they drive. And we wanted to give the player the feeling of reward and expansion and gaining those cool areas and those cool things. And over the years, you know, we've talked about putting them in yachts, giving them private jets, giving them flats in Monaco and, and things like that. So while we didn't go quite to those extremes, it is a chance for the player to have their own personalized space in the game. It's also somewhere where over long term, you know, we can grow that space to, to showcase players' rewards and achievements within the game. We've added a real virtual trophy cabinet space in there so you'll be able to see people's trophy cabinets and what they've acquired if that's a space that you see when they're in the multiplayer lobby for example you'll see the supercars that they've won again showcasing those cool cool items throughout there and it gives us an opportunity to just bring other things into the game and to add other forms of progression so to a formula one purist you need nothing more than a replication of a Formula One season. That is reward in itself, you know, to take part in a Formula One season and to go through from start to finish. But to some of the more emerging new casual players, you know, you need other things to keep you invested as well, other things to keep rewarding you along the way. And, and that's what we wanted to do with F1 Life. Give the player an area that they can personalise, give them an area that, you know, if you don't choose to engage with the, the um, clothing items for your character, so be it. You know, it's, it's not for everyone. But there's a lot of people who will really enjoy that and will really find that, you know, creating that a space that's theirs is, is important to them. It's actually been relatively, I say relatively easy. I mean, I'm sure the, the handling team would say otherwise, but um, the, the, they absolutely were relishing the task. They were so excited to do that because it was the let's just take all of the details of a road car put them into our physics engine and see how it comes out and it was incredible there, there were some tweaks needed to the suspension um, so the, the physics code for the suspension needed some work over time it had become very f1 specific in what it was trying to achieve so there were some changes made there the tire model obviously we use the same physics code but the model that we use is, is very different in terms of I mean, the obvious one being a Formula One car has something ridiculous like, like 1.5 to 3 degrees peak slip angle and then a road car is 
25 something like this it's a huge amount compared um so that's that's one of the biggest changes was in creating a tire model that allowed for the accuracy and and you know precision of a, of a supercar but also the the fun and the ability to chuck it around and drift and, and really you know feel it uh you know moving around beneath you so it was it was not as challenging as i think we thought it could have been uh, and it also really is a, it's another great way to continue evolving our physics tech as well That's not something we do in at launch. Uh, it's something we can continue to, to pursue for the future. Yeah, it's the opportunity to drive those cars in time trial. And, and they look incredible. They look absolutely incredible. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how to answer this one because the difficulty came from somewhere that nobody could ever foresee. Um, so, you know, completely honestly about this one, as I mentioned with VR, we've partnered with people this year to allow us to really grow the scale of the game. And the team we partnered with to do the crossplay work were located in the Ukraine. So something that we could never foresee, unfortunately, meant that that's going to take a little bit longer to deliver than we were expecting. And, and priority for us was ensuring that that team was safe and that everybody was well looked after and that they obviously weren't worried about producing work for us and that they were concerned, yeah, we were concerned that they, they were all happy and healthy. Um, they've been so great to work with and they've wanted to make sure that they continue to deliver. And it's actually, in their opinion, really helped them that obviously we've supported them, but they've wanted to do work to take their mind off what was going on outside their windows. So that's where the challenge has come from. Obviously, Formula One's also an incredibly complex game. And we focused on the areas where we see the biggest gain for this first implementation, which is, of course, in any of the social play. So if you want to create a lobby, you can invite any of your friends in and also in the two player career. I think that's one of the those are the two main areas where um, cross play will obviously be as the most beneficial in this year's game. It's, it's a really difficult one to gauge because it's very hard to get a person who can be so consistent that you can place them on a PC, on an Xbox, on a PlayStation and get exactly the same output and the same out out outcome from them from doing so. There's no doubt that the controllers feel differently on, on both platforms. There's no getting away from the fact that a, a Xbox controller feels different to a PlayStation controller, be that in the inputs, be that in the way that the, the consoles behave. Um, but everything we do, we do to ensure that the, those games are identical. But there's no doubt the frame rate has an impact on PC. You know, there's a reason why players play first-person shooters on PC beyond just the fact that they can increase the field of view. So we do everything we can to ensure our physics run exactly the same on every platform. So there's absolutely no difference between those, those platforms. And then it just comes down to those elements where if I'm using a wheel or I'm using a different wheel, that's going to have an impact. You know, if I'm using a PlayStation controller or an Xbox controller, I'm more proficient on one more than the other. Yeah, there's always going to be those differences, but everything we do in the game is to ensure that the, it is exactly the same. Yeah, it, it, it just comes down to the being able to get solid reference. Um, as soon as the circuits have got the CAD data for us, you know, we, we can start work on those changes. And those are established circuits. I think Melbourne was probably one of the most interesting because, again, that's a, a street track that was changing. Uh, but I think that's the one that, for me, has had the, the real, the, the biggest change. It really has changed the character of that track completely. And for a circuit that was the first race of the season for so long for us, where most of us making the game would have started their career playthrough hundreds of times a week and played Melbourne. To have a different version of Melbourne is really, really cool. I say they are really well, really well received every year. And, uh, you know, driver career represents Formula One very, very accurately. My team puts you in a totally different position and the ability to be able to play it out uh, as you would as a, as a team boss. Department events are those kinds of questions that come up to a driver or to a team boss that they need to come up with a, a response which has an outcome. 
Um, what we wanted to do was take away, so something I didn't mention yesterday was we've, we've removed um, Meet the Press and we've repurposed some of the driver, the, some of the department events to actually bring in Meet the Press elements. So instead of being interviewed face to face in Meet the Press, they'll come through the press office. So it'll be a case of the press office need to know an answer to this question. And the way that the player responds will impact on team morale, will impact on how the team performance goes, will impact on potential sponsor goals. And then as you look into sort of how that works in, in my team, you're being asked from the perspective of, well, you're the team boss. Do you want to invest in this for the team? Do you want to take a risk that this won't break down? That license is going to expire. Do you think we can carry on running that particular software without a license? If it packs up, do we need to get, uh, you know, do we have to pay more to get that, that re you know, resolved? So it's giving that, that extra level of management elements to it um, in a relatively light and, and obviously a pros and cons way. You know, it could be the, if I decide to spend money on something in the short term, it's a bit of an expense, but it means long term everything goes well. Might be I choose not to put that investment in, hope it all works, and five weeks later there's a, a failure at the factory that's causing me, you know, development slowdown, or it's going to cost me more in the long run. So those those were some of the main considerations, but also what we do with the start point as well. To, again, which which ties very heavily into the for a more casual player, they want to be winning races. That means my team's an area of the game that's quite alienated and quite, you know, quite harsh for them. So, they, but now they can start with a team that's already well funded, got strong, uh, you know, funding, great sponsors, and the ability to have a, a leading driver. So again, it was it was covering two two angles there, making it more accessible, but also giving players the choice of how they want to play it.